Good evening. Welcome. Hello. My name is Lale Kharivi. I am this term's Stein visiting writer, and I'm very excited to be here tonight. My job is to introduce the panel and introduce myself a little bit and get the evening rolling and then to moderate the question and answer session afterwards. We are so glad that you all came, especially on this sort of rainy day. Um, I'm a novelist. I write fiction. I'm also a documentary filmmaker and a professor of creative writing at the University of San Francisco MFA program. Before beginning, I would like to express tremendous thanks to the Stein family, as well as to Christina and Hamid Mogadam family for their support of Iranian, sta Iranian studies, culture, and art. This position at Stanford came at a very important time in my creative life. Five years ago, the last volume of my trilogy, the Kurdish trilogy as it has come to be known, was published. It follows the lives of three generations of Kurdish Iranian men, a grandfather, a father, and a son as they navigate the transitions from tribal life to citizenship to what I'm calling post-national existence. These were books written in the voice of men about men's worlds. And for a dozen years, I wrote male characters to better understand Iran and the diaspora. Now, after a break, I am changing lenses to look upon the complicated subject of what it me meant, means, and will mean to be Iranian from a distinctly female perspective. So imagine my delight when I spoke with Roma and Dr. Milani and the book Never Invisible came up. Not only a book, but a primary document written by a woman whose approach to life in her gives us her on the scene accounts with a journalistic depth, but graceful, generous, and bold. Not only a witness, but participant to tumultuous histories, a mother, and a pillar of the philanthropic community, Ms. Mogadam gives us her, gives us her on the scene accounts with a journalistic deftness. While those are priceless, what struck me most profoundly about the book is her curiosity, her ability to observe people, the times, the world around her, and the self-confidence to record her observations in her journal. The act of a woman keeping a diary has a long history. My Khale Farideh, who lives in Esfahan, has written in her diary every day for the last 70 years. Shea Shonagon and Lady Murasaki of Imperial Japan kept diaries, mostly to complain about bad lovers and court life. Anna Esnen wanted to write about her life, at the time daring because she valued transparency and thought other women would want to read it, and they did, and both of her diaries were bestsellers. The first generation of female homesteaders in the West also kept diaries for similar reasons, to say, we are here, we are surviving, we are witnesses to this wild new life. The diary, a balm against loneliness, against silence and invisibility, is also, like the cell phone, a transmission. <laughs> Through the details of births, marriages, meals, tragedies, and celebration, we receive a sense of how life was through the lives of women and then for whole civilizations. Ms. Mogadam clearly understood this, but she also understood that to take the time and note the motions of her exterior and interior life offered a strength of spirit. To mark one's days on the page, to recognize your own self-worth and the worth of your ideas and actions is not historically what the women of many countries in the Middle East are known for. And yet, from a world, world that restricted women's movement, women's voices, Ms. Mogadam rose, taking her intelligence and desire and her self-value seriously. Her diaries are chronicles of a civilization in flux, a cultural world shifting and then shifting again. And through the simple technology of a book comes a voice. And that voice has its own gorgeous style. The writing itself is lucid, filled with evocative details, place settings, clothes, food, and personality. She is exactly where the reader needs her to be, above, seeing the narrative all at once while also living in the moment. I appreciated her sly sense of humor. Quote, that summer, having already passed my 11th grade exams, there wasn't much to do but eavesdrop, end quote. <laughs> and her delicate sense of scene and the section where she takes Miriam to see a performance of Hansel and Gretel in Hamburg and notices how fascinated the children are by the oranges that she's brought and ends up sharing them. 
This book is not simply the observations of a woman who was lucky to see the world on her terms, but it's also a document of keen witness, and in some ways, participant to the changing definition of what it means to be an Iranian woman, a term that continues to change before our eyes today. Please joining me in welcoming the panelists. Ladan Lari is Ms. Mogadan's second daughter. She currently serves as Senior Vice President and relationship manager, Relationships Manager, Commercial Banking in Heritage San Francisco's office, managing a portfolio of commercial clients, real estate investors, and developers. Leila Pur Hashemi is the first grandchild of Huri Mostafe Mogadam and the daughter of Miriam Mogadam. Purushami is currently the Chief Information Officer at Black Hawk Network. Kumar Gerialu is the Curator for Middle Eastern Collections at Stanford's Green Library. And Dr. Abbas Milani is the Director of the Hamid and Christine Mogadam Program in Iranian Studies at Stanford University, an adjunct professor and co-director of the Iranian Democracy Project, and a research fellow at the Hoover Institution. Please help me welcome them tonight. And I do believe we begin with Adan. Sure. Thank you all for joining us this evening, and thank you to Stanford and Dr. Milani for having arranged this event. I'm certain that my mother, Huri, who wrote her daily journals over several decades, and my sister, Mariam, who tirelessly translated and composed them into this book, would have been pleased to see it well received. Reading Never Invisible has been a really emotional journey for me. Now, five years after my mother left us at almost 99, and less than six months after my sister, Marianne, passed away from cancer at 78. It brought back sweet and bitter memories. I relived my childhood and youth, traveled all over the world with mother, met amazing individuals, marveled at how she rebuilt a life, a rich life for herself, living alone in exile until the age of 92 in Paris, the south of France, in San Francisco, and how she overcame her depression by earning a PhD from Sorbonne at the age of 65. As she admits in the book, writing comes easily to me, but getting something published was never my main interest. I believe she tasked Mariam to translate her diary into English so that her grandchildren, and particularly her great-grandchildren, whose knowledge of the Persian language was limited, would one day read them and learn about their heritage and ancestry. So I really, personally, don't believe she really expected these to be published. In translating the diaries, Mariam was racing against time. When our mother passed away in 2018, she had only translated about half of the diaries. When her illness took a turn for the worse during the pandemic, and she eventually retired from running the School of Practical Philosophy in California, which she had founded in 2004, she was laser focused on completing the work and keeping her promise to our mother. The day before she passed, I went over to say goodbye. She was lying in her bed, breathing with great difficulty. As I sat by her bedside, she asked for her cell phone and her glasses. She quickly scrolled down on her, to her emails and found the one she had received from the publisher a couple of weeks earlier. She handed the phone to me and pointed to the picture, to the image of the book's front and back, and asked, do you think mom would have approved of this? In Never Invisible, my mother, who was an excellent storyteller, with a photographic memory and great attention to detail, takes us from her childhood all the way to her mid-80s. The diaries continued for another decade, after which she stopped writing, announcing that she had nothing more to say. 
We later found out that she was losing her eyesight in one eye due to macular degeneration. A devout Muslim who never smoked or touched alcohol, who prayed daily to the very end, and who made two pilgrimages to Mecca, Huri was nevertheless a true trailblazer. As a young woman, she was one of the first Iranian women university graduates in 1941. In fact, I just brought over her um, bachelor's diploma, the original that I had found. And so you're going to be able to archive that. Um, she, when she received her bachelor's degree in French literature and immediately started working full time teaching high school French. She was married a couple of years later and had Mariam in 1944. A year later, she enrolled at the Faculty of Law at Tehran University, graduating in 1948 when I was born. So I've got a law degree. <laughs> she was fluent in French and English, was an avid skier, excellent tennis player, and an equestrian. In midlife and her later years, she was a scholar, an excellent bridge player, a philanthropist, a socialite, and fashionista. <laughs> a true lifelong learner, she translated a novel by the famous 19th century French author Balzac into Persian at the age of 21, won a Fulbright scholarship to the University of Michigan at 40, enrolled in the PhD program in French literature at the Sorbonne at the age of 60. When we were growing up, she was a working mom for whom her home life was just as important as her teaching career and her community service work. Fiercely independent, mom was outspoken and fearless, proud of her Iranian heritage and her faith. She spoke her mind, challenging senior politicians and diplomats abroad and revolutionary interrogators at the Islamic courts. I'd like to read a couple of passages from the book to illustrate this. The first one is from 1990, when she was attending a conference given by Raymond Barr, the French prime minister during the time of the Islamic revolution in Iran. At the time, Iraq had just attacked Kuwait. The conference was moderated by a journalist from French TV and was attended by business and financial leaders. She writes, I had prepared several questions to ask Prime Minister Ba and was wearing a black dress with a bright red jacket so he would not be able to miss me. As soon as the opportunity arose, I raised my hand. I was handed a microphone. My hand shook a little as I hadn't held a microphone in many years. I tried to control myself and continued. My question is addressed to the Prime Minister. Sir, don't you think that your support of Saddam Hussein at the time of the Iran-Iraq war was the cause of the present situation? It was your encouragement and support that spurred Saddam to attack Kuwait. Mr. Barr replied, the Middle East is a land of contrasts and complexities that we can never quite understand. Realizing that he was avoiding my question, I interrupted him and I said, Mr. Prime Minister, it is a fact that the Middle East is a complicated part of the world, but politics is even more complex than that. I was in Paris at the time of the Iranian Re Revolution, and I saw how you helped and supported the revolutionaries. Baal replied, Khomeini was a political refugee. I countered, there are many political refugees in France. Does the French government install 35 phone lines and put three TV channels at their disposal so they can broadcast their message everywhere? The second passage is from November 1992, when my mother had gone to Tehran to try to negotiate the release of her house, which had been confiscated by the Islamic Republic authorities. 
Here she's at the Revolutionary Court being interrogated. Question, you've been living abroad for many years. Answer, yes, 14 years. Interrogator, what were you doing during this time? Huri, I left for medical treatment. I had a tumor on my kidney. While abroad, I became seriously depressed. To help myself, I enrolled at the Sorbonne and obtained my PhD in 1985. Question, what was your job before that? Answer, I was a high school French teacher and an instructor in English at Medley University. Question, what were you involved in? Answer, I was twice elected as president of the International Women's Club. Interrogator, did you have any relationship with the Imperial Court? Answer, no, sir. Interrogator, you're not telling the truth. Huri, if you ask the right question, you will hear the right answer. <laughs> Do I have a relationship with you? Interrogator, no. Huri, I have come to you to resolve an issue. Having a relationship is quite vague in Persian. I have contact with the imperial court in order to secure a piece of land to build a children's convalescent home. Do you think that relationship served a useful purpose? Interrogator, yes, it was a good idea. <laughs> Thank you again for coming today. Thank you again for coming today. That was wonderful, Love Antoine. Thank you. Well, as you've now heard, we are a family of storytellers with photographic memory, so this is going to be dangerous. But um, <laughs> I'll start with a little bit about my mom because we heard about my grandma. So, you know, my mother lived with stage four cancer for 10 years, which is considered quite a feat. And every time her health would take a turn, you know, usually for the worse, you know, we'd get worried. She said, Don't worry, I will be here as long as my work is not done, and my work is not done. Mm -hmm. And over the years, she would keep repeating this and repeating this, and, and we just heard you know, what happened. The same day as you were asked to scroll on the phone, I was asked to open the laptop and to confirm, this was November 15th, that the publisher had sent a final approval with all the pictures and like done, done, as we call it, and uh, that there were no more emails. And I checked the laptop, and it was done. And she said, good, thank you. And she literally passed away early morning the next day okay. on the 16th. And so the first of our little stories about two other books. Um, so right after Mommy passed, you came over. And Ladan always shows up with interesting things. And she showed up with a small bag of quince, which was in season at that time. And we visited a little bit, and Ladan went home, and I'm sitting here, my sister and my dad, Fahri, and we're looking at this quince, and we were wondering what we should do with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, okay, you know, mommy used to make quince stew, quince choreshte, choreshte be. So I'll go, I'll go look up the recipe, because we should do something with this lovely quince. And so my mother had this nice collection of Persian cookbooks, three of which are by Najmi about Mongalish. Mm -hmm. This is important in a moment. Um, it's the food of life, the new food of life, and the healthy food of life. <laughs> so I chose the new food of I have all three at home, too, but we were at mom's house. So I chose the new food of life. And I go to the appendix, and I look up Choresh uh, And I see the page, and I flip from the back to the page. And you would not believe this, but the ribbon was already there. Mm -hmm. The ribbon was already there. She had made it the prior Beh season, which would have been a year before, because Beh is in very, very short season. And the other interesting thing that ties the story to this event is that the book is written by Najmi about Mangalij, whose husband is the publisher of this book. And so there we go. That's how the story ended. And so you know, while my mother was doing the translations of all of these journals, which were meticulously written in the most beautiful and most tiniest handwriting, in French and in Farsi sometimes, yeah. but never in English. Um, you know, mom would be translating different sections, and when we visited, we would, you know, she would remember the the stories as they had happened because she was in that section of 
of Mama Huri's life. And um, so one story, which was very interesting, was the beginning of the end of my modeling career. And it was also your modeling yeah. career. <laughs> and um, Sam's not here, but I think she featured as well. So, um, so you, if any of you have read the book or when you read the book, you will learn about this, this uh, fashion show, an event that was put on by, by Huri Jun about the history of women's Costumes, costumes mm -hmm. and clothing, and a lot of costumes were made. Some were found, and so on and so forth, over the many hundreds of years of the evolution of all of this. And then later, it became a book called Negarizan. Mm -hmm. And I got to be one of the models. I was about nine, I think, or yeah. so. And I thought it was fascinating, because the costume I got to wear had about 10 layers of skirts on top of each other. Because as was the custom, every year you got a new skirt, and you put them on top of each other. And it was sort of a bit of a sign of wealth to have more skirts and mm -hmm. you kind of have grown up. And so I, I got to hold the hands of a, of a, a little bit older lady who um, you know, took me down the, the, uh, the aisle and uh, did the modeling career. And then the book came out and that was a very big moment for Mama Huri. I remember it even as a child that she was able to do this and it was a lot of money at the time that yeah. was raised for charity. Mm -hmm. And so that was the story of another book that was another labor of love that had happened during this time. And my mom was a model there, and so were you, and so was I, and mm -hmm. never after that. But, uh, you know, just in clothing, closing, um, my grandmother was very much into clothes, and she gave some very pertinent advice. And I looked around. I think everybody here has adhered to this advice. But one piece of advice I received was that you should never wear yellow with brown. <laughs> so fortunately, I own very little yellow and no brown, so I'm not usually at risk, but I just checked. I think we're all good with this story. So, there I was we go. looking. Yeah, you know, you got to be careful. Very likely to wear exactly that. you got to be careful with these things. You have to be careful. So, you know, I'm grateful to be here. As, as Laudan and I were saying, the two people who should be here yeah. are unfortunately not. Mm -hmm. But uh, we're happy that we can celebrate this with everyone here. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, uh, welcome to Stanford. And uh, my presentation is about the contents of the collection. So the collection is in three languages, Persian, French, and English. It consists of more than 50 items, including 24 legal-sized diary notebooks. Only three of them are in Persian. The rest are in French. There are also seven wired Notebooks, they're all in Persian, and these wires notebook, notebooks contain uh, Huria Magadam's diaries in Persian in seven volumes from 1919 uh, to 2007. One of these notebooks covers almost a decade, the period between 1979 and 1988. Um, I have included a picture of the cover of this one here, and as you see, that she had written down three titles for this particular volume, and uh, one of them is Dastan Maud, the other one is Karname Man, Ya Durud Bezanan Iran. So the other wired notebook, which is a hefty and which is hefty and supposed to serve as volume one of Huri's diaries in Persian, documents her life over uh, six decades from her birth in 1919 to 1979. Uh, the collection includes a few imprints. Uh, for example, this title, this is the one that you the mentioned, book? Nagara Zan, mm -hmm. an historical pageant of women's dress in Iran, which was published in 1973 mm -hmm. by the International Women's Club of Iran. Um, and this item, the next one, which is a copy of Huri Muradam's father, Abdullah Mustafi's translation into Persian of a medieval Arabic philosophical treatise. Uh, on the title page, there is a handwritten note dated October 17, 1945, and signed by the translator, which reads, Baraye Mutale'e Dukhtar Fazalam Huri Muradam, for the study of my well educated daughter, Huri Muradam. Uh, and as you know, Abdullah Mustafi served as a diplomat and high-ranking official in the Ministry of Justice under the later Qajars and then during the reign of Reza Shah. The proofs of the English translation of his um, administrative and social history of the Qajar period prepared by Nayir Mustafi Glenn 
are included in the Huria Mogadam's collection. Uh, the English version of the book was published, sorry, uh, the English version of the book was published in 1997 LA. Uh, the other interesting item included in the collection is Huria Mogadam's university ID card when she was a first year student. So I have to check the dates because I'm, I wasn't sure. But here it says, and For here, what here? For the uh, uh, diploma? No, this is her. Uh, so this one is from her first year at the oh, university. First year at the university. Yes. Okay. That sounds right. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, uh, when she was a first year student at the Tehran University Faculty of Law, Political Science and e Economics in 1946. The ID card is signed by the head of faculty at the time, who was Dr. Karim Sanjuavi, but the, the signature is not visible. So. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a small notebook containing notes in Persian by Nasrullah Mustafi. I wasn't sure if this is Nasrullah Mustafi, her it's grand her uncle. Her uncle, because her uncle, meaning, meaning mom's oldest brother, okay. oldest brother, Nasrullah. Okay. Because her grandfather too was named Nasrullah, mm -hmm. so I wasn't sure which one of them uh, is uh, you know? the author of this notes. But yes, you're right. I think uh, her brother. Yeah, yeah. So Huri's brother and a high-ranking bureaucrat under the later Qajars and the early Pahlavis. This document seems to be part of a larger volume, as you see from the page number here, which is yet to be found. I don't know uh, where is that volume. So, uh, but it's really interesting. It contains lots of interesting details about political uh, events at the time. As part of this collection, we have received copies of Huria Mogadam's doctoral thesis in French, mm -hmm. which is titled Henri Moua, Humaniste et Moraliste. Uh, it was submitted to the Sorbonne in November 1985, uh, when Huria Magadam was 66, so 65. Uh, she completed her dissertation with René Pomo, uh, one of the most prominent French scholars of 18th century French literature, a member of the Académie des sciences morales et politiques in Paris, and an expert authority on Voltaire. Uh, Copies of two other dissertations are included in the Mogadam collection. One is a master thesis by Huria Mogadam's son, Hamid Reza, completed in March 1978 and submitted to MIT Department of Civil Engineering. The other one is a copy of a doctoral thesis in French by uh, Shirin Ardalan. I wasn't sure. That would be our, my mom's cousin. Yes, so I was right. One of Huria's cousins uh, on the history of the Ardalan courts in medieval and early modern Iran. Mm -hmm. so, this was four years later was published as a book and it's a really important contribution to the history of Kurds in Iran. And one last item, which is a special issue of the Qajar Studies Journal, uh, you see here, published in 2006. It contains two important and well-researched articles by Huria Mogadam. They're exceptionally uh, important and well Research. One article explores the history of the Ardalan courts under the Qajars, and the other one is about the descendants of the Qajar Fatali Shah. So it's an amazing article. Lots of details about lots of, you know, sons, daughters of Fatali Shah. And so these are the main items. Actually, I included everything about the, the items in the collection. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. Uh, uh, let me tell you briefly uh, how I first came across uh, these uh, daily journals and how they landed here. Uh, Mrs. Mogadam was very kind to me. Occasionally would cook Asher Eshe, invite me to her house, and uh, tell me how the Iranian studies program should be run. <laughs> and I listened and uh, abided when I could. And she chastised me when I didn't. <laughs> and one day she said, uh, let me read you a little bit of something. And uh, she brought one of these books and began reading passages. And then she told me she has kept these memoirs for almost 50 years. I almost uh, passed out. I, I said, you should uh, think about giving these to Stanford. She said, oh, nobody wants to read this stuff. This is my daily stuff. I said, there is nothing like this anywhere this is going to be 
a remarkable addition to any library. She said no. And, uh, but I knew that she knew this belonged to a library. If anyone in the world knew that this collection belongs to a library, it was Mrs. Moratna. Uh, it, it took many, many, many years for it to land here. Uh, and uh, it was uh, because uh, of uh, uh, her, her Not sister, me. and her, her uh, yeah. uh, brother, uh, mm -hmm. your brother, Hamid Moradam, uh, who eventually, after much insistence by me, agreed to give these to Stanford. Uh, if, when I first uh, asked her to contribute these to Stanford, uh, I would not have in my wildest imagination thought that in the year that a woman called Mahsa Amini, mm -hmm. the Ardalan family are Kurdish royalty. Uh, her name is Huriye uh, Mustofiye Mogaddame Ardalan. We can put it in any sequence you want. Uh, and the year that we would be celebrating this book, we would have Mahsa Amini as the icon of the Iranian women's movement. And in that year, we would have the uh, writer in residence at Stanford, a woman of Kurdish origin. And we would be able to ask her uh, to uh, uh, coordinate this uh, meeting. The document is remarkable. The, document, the collection is remarkable. And she is, I think, very remarkable. Uh, I want to read, uh, in these uh, occasions, this very, uh, when we're talking about a book, to try to read a couple of passages from it. If you read a couple of passages, I want to read a couple of sure. passages to give you the flavor, flavor. of uh, uh, But before getting into the book, I want to thank Muhammad and Najmi batman Once they realized that uh, uh, Maryam was sick, they really uh, went out of their way, working against time, hope against hope, to finish this while she was still able to finish it. And if you made a movie when a f book would be finished and next morning the person who's doing it will pass away, they would say, this is an Indian film. Things like this never happen in reality. <laughs> but sometimes reality is more beautiful, more romantic, more remarkable than even the best of. So let me read you uh, one passage from uh, Maryam's uh, uh, writing, and one passage from her. Uh, and I'm at the age where I can't see with glasses and I can't see without glasses. <laughs> it says, Defending Iranian Heritage. I knew Dr. N from Iran. Uh, and anybody who knows uh, contemporary Iranian situation know who this Dr. N is. I knew Dr. M from Iran, and because she didn't put it, I'm not going to tell you who it is, uh, and consider him to be both scholarly and patriotic. She has a big exclamation mark next to patriotic. Something had been troubling me for a while. A book had been published in the University of California, Berkeley, in which there was a reference to Maulana Jalaluddin, better known as Rumi, being born in Baal, Afghanistan. As I read on, I realized there was no indication of this famous mystic philosopher being Iranian. In the introduction of the book, Dr. N was named as the editor of the work and responsible for its publication. I was truly upset with what, what I considered an obvious disregard for our rich Iranian heritage. One evening at a function we were both attending in Washington, DC, I found an opportunity to take Dr. N to one side and bring up the subject with him. And if you know Uri Mughadam, you know Mr. Dr. N is in for trouble. <laughs> <clears throat> he, had, uh, he heard me out, then replied that surely it would have been mentioned somewhere else in the book that Rumi was pre Persian. As I reminded him, 800 years ago, Bath was part of Iran. Afghanistan was only founded in 1709. How could you allow them to print this misinformation in the introduction to the book? He became very defensive as I went on. What a pity that someone would be prepared to sell their country's heritage in exchange for a few thousand greenbacks. And I walked away. 
leaving him in his misery. <laughs> now, I want to read uh, uh, what Maryam has written, uh, and uh, just a couple of pages of how the book came about. By the time Ladan and I, with a team of helpers, had unpacked and placed everything in the new house, you would have thought she had lived there all her life. The only new piece of furniture we bought was a very fancy bed. Otherwise, every precious item, her paintings, 40 years of diaries she had kept, all of her books, every delightful bureau and side table fit perf perfectly in the large four-bedroom house. She walked in like a new bride. For the first time, as long as I remember, she had nothing to criticize. <clears throat> Her bedroom was the size of her Paris apartment. There was a swimming pool, which no one ever used in the seven years she lived there. Most importantly, I think she realized she was being cared for in a way and at a standard that would become the envy of all her friends. The years passed. She would take a walk every afternoon in our quiet street, sometimes reciting aloud French poems she had memorized as a young girl. If any of the neighbors were out, they would always greet her with her elegant walking stick and in her cool jogging outfit. Sometimes she would come into our front yard and peer through the kitchen window to see if I was there. And every Friday night, we would have dinner together. In the afternoons, I would visit her for half an hour. We watched old movies together and laughed when neither of us could remember the names of the actors. Caregivers came and went. She belonged to a generation when staff were staff, and familiarity was not encouraged, even though she gradually needed their help to put on her stockings. After a while, she lost complete interest in what went on in the house and kitchen, and her best caregiver, Emily, took over. I'm really grateful for those years. Ours had not always been an easy relationship. I'm sure we were all loved, but it was not the warm, hugging kind of love we now have with our children. It was respectful, and she was always proud of our achievements, but it was never intimate. I had left home at 14 and never really returned, as I was married at 18 and had my own life. <laughs> Ours was not the kind of mother-daughter relationship where we went shopping together or missed each other. It was quite formal cordial and detached. And yet, she spent the last years of her life tirelessly to make what her mother wanted realize. So it was a loving relationship. And Huri uh, Mogadam, in spite of her distance, is how, in, in spite of the fact that she lived a truly independent life. At 1961, she left three children and her husband and her household to come and do a Fulbright. Folks, when Simina Doneshvar did, everyone wrote about it as being a feminist act. No one even knew that someone like her did this in 1961. And she stood up to everybody, including her husband, and including her family, who said, why are you leaving your uh, children and going? She said, I need to do it. So she was fiercely independent. And she truly is, I, I wrote, I had the good fortune of being asked to write an introduction uh, to this uh, book. And I begin it this way. I'll just read one paragraph and then uh, say no more. The arc of justice in Iranian women's relentless struggle for equality, always heroic in spirit sometimes seamlessly, seemingly hopeless in trajectory, is today universally recognized in the name of Mahsa Amini, an Iranian Kurdish woman who, accused of wearing the hijab in an improper manner, died in suspicious circumstances in September 2020. The progressive nature of that movement is captured in the three words that have now become his clarion call, woman, life, freedom. Like all apparent political eruptions, this movement, too, has its roots in struggle that has gone on in Iran for at least 150 years. 
and Huri's Mogadam's memoirs offer a reminder of the depth and the endurance of this movement. Thank you. So we would like to open up the conversation and the expertise of our panelists to the audience for a question and answer. And I welcome you all to take advantage of this amazing opportunity we have. Those are excellent introductions. And if you don't, I'll make something. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, Laura and June, uh, you said that uh, your grandmother um, had, uh, your mom actually, your mom um, uh, finished law school uh, when she was pregnant with you. Did she practice law? No. At that time, uh, the faculty of law had three specialties or majors, if you will. They could major in politics, they could major in law, and what was the third? Economics. One? Economics, there you go. So the first two years, it was common between all three. The third year was actually a special, the year that they were specialized. She got her degree in politics. So she never, but she had a mind of a lawyer. I mean, the way she stood up to people, and the way she would use her knowledge of the Quran to respond to the inter interrogators in the Islamic court so that she would disarm them because she knew more about the religion that they did. And so um, I think it's that legal mind that was always working. Yeah, she sounds amazing. I can't wait to read the book. Yeah. Um, she definitely is ahead of her time and a trailblazer and I'm proud that I'm somewhat tiny bit related to her. Um, if she were here now and with the women like um, Freedom Revolution happening in Iran, what do you think she would say and who do you think she would talk to to convince them that, you know, something must be done? Is the question to me or to Leila? To all of you. <laughs> and, I'm sorry. <laughs> I think she would be very upset. I think she... I think she would be proud that a Kurdish woman mm -hmm. was the one who stood up, maybe without trying to, and became the symbol. But I think she would have been very sad uh, to see so many people being killed. And basically, it's fizzled out, from what I can see. I, I, I don't think it has fizzled out. I hope out. you're right. No, I, I, I hope I'm right, too. But, uh, uh, I, I don't think it has fizzled out. And I, I think, you, obviously, you know her infinitely more than I do. I, I think she would have been proud. And I think she would have said, Th these are my children. These are the people that I educated. And some of them were mm -hmm. uh, her yeah. uh, uh, students. Mm -hmm. We had an event here for Shirin Ebadi. And Shirin Ebadi came, and uh, the minute that I met uh, uh, Hamid Mokadam says, you know, I was uh, your mother's student mm -hmm. uh, and uh, described how good a teacher she was. So I think she would have been proud and I don't think it has fizzled out. You look at uh, uh, images every day. These people are, these women in Iran particularly are relentless and brilliant and defiant and the clergy brutal. And she would have said, the clergy are not true Islam. There is a better Islam somewhere else. <laughs> she always yes, that's true. Yeah. That she always said. Hamid. Uh, question, uh, Professor Maloney, uh, two parts. One, would you give uh, a sense of how you chose the two passages and what motivated you to choose those ones? And uh, also, I was wondering if anyone knows, um, it came to my attention that it was another woman that hit Nasa Ali in the head, initially. Yes. And I'm wondering if anybody is discussing this. Uh, first of all, nobody is discussing it because uh, the so-called morality police for women have to be women. Uh, part of the uh, rules is that uh, uh, no mahram can't even beat these uh, uh, mahrams, although sometimes they do. Uh, so the fact that there was a woman is part of the nature of these reactionary laws. Uh, and the way I chose it was because, uh, first of all, uh, defending the Iranian heritage 
although she kept talking about Islam, defending the Iranian heritage was very much part of what she wanted to do. And uh, she loved it. She loved the Persian language. She came to a, a performance we had of Professor Beizai, and she was so taken by the language that she got up, began clapping, bravo, said, this is another Ferdowsi. Uh, heritage of the language was for her essential. So I wanted to show that, and to show that she stands up to a guy who uh, defends uh, Islam was, and was a close advisor to the queen. Um, I have a question in regards to the previous question. Um, so she clearly was a trailblazer and affected the lives of the women who she was a teacher for or a role model for. And as I was reading in the beginning, I was looking very carefully to see who did she look to? Her mother. And her mother, there was no schools for women at that time. Like, how but did she guide herself intellectually? Her well, Faramaz is here, and I would rather have him talk because he knows better than I do. But my grandfather, mm -hmm. uh, my mother's father, was very much a scholar, a diplomat very prime and proper, um, very much a gentleman. My grandmother, on the other hand, was a feisty woman, extremely strong, you know, and um, outspoken. When Mehri Jun, um, Fadi's mom and my aunt, um, finished 11th grade, she turned around, and I'll say this in Farsi, because the audience is mostly Farsi, she said, <laughs> They have opened up the universities to, the, to women. You should be the first students to go to university. So I think they got their, you know, their strength from their mother. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the brain and the, not, not, she was smart, but she was not as highly educated as my grandfather was. Mm -hmm. And the scholarly, side from the grandfather, and the two came together okay. in my mother. Yeah, that makes sense. That kuzab shubukharin for the Americans means it ain't worth deadly. That's right. <laughs> I thought we need to be it translated. Thank you. Yes. I'd like to mention something that I remember clearly, because both my mother and Huri John finished a degree in law from Tehran University in political sciences. There were three branches, economics, politics, and uh, judiciary. And their idea was to enter the f foreign office. And they both applied. Oh, that's right. And the reply was, we do not employ ladies into the diplomatic section of this uh, ministry, only for secretariat. And here was two women who were by the way, the first ladies who graduated from the law school at Tehran University at the time. And knowing their qualifications, if anything, probably even with their level of uh, depth in learning, better than most men being told that you're not good enough for the services, only for the secretariat. So, I think Huri Jun, as I said, probably here, I'm the only one who remembers her longest because uh, she was my aunt at first before becoming my mother-in-law. She was truly a unique person in many, many ways. I have so many stories. I wrote a book about myself, but maybe one day my story about these two sisters is worth putting pen to paper. Thank you. And this wonderful gentleman is, of course, my father, <laughs> Paramar Safinia, first oldest, oldest uh, nephew, I guess, of Huri Muqaddam, and uh, has known them both the longest, by definition. There's a funny story, if you have time, about Mr. Mokadam coming for Khosa Gari. Huri <laughs> um, didn't want to, absolutely. Mr. Mokadam had a, 
a beautiful brand new Chrysler car. <laughs> what both on those days there were very few. Uh, so he'd come with his Chrysler, and Wurujun was one of the very few ladies who had a driver's license in Tehran. And he offered the key to Hurijon. I was uh, probably about 11, and she was in her early 20s. And she took the key and she said, Farid, they call me short for Farid Farawaz, you have to come with me because I love driving, but obviously I wasn't of an age to drive. And we drove. And then we went, uh, uh, I remember clearly, the road to Sadobot, near the king's palace. And at the end, we had to do a U-turn, but it was a narrow street. And she had to back. And those days, there were these uh, brooks that water ran and everything. There was a difference in level and so on. So she reversed and reversed, and she literally put the back of the car in that <laughs> ravine. <laughs> And now we couldn't go. And those days, it was not automatic transmission. It was gear shift and clutch. Now, it was very difficult to be very fast, bringing the clutch up, releasing the brake, and pressing the accelerator pedal. So I bent at that age, I remember. I said, who did you? You take care of the brake and the clutch. I take care of the accelerator. <laughs> and I head down there, pressing on this thing. And the wheels were turning, and we came out. And as soon as we came, he said, Fari, no mention of this to <laughs> And you should get that promise. <laughs> and I'm sure she will forgive me for sharing it. Thank you. Any other questions? I have a question in terms of the archive. Yes. Uh, I'm curious because Stanford is such a robust and diverse community, and you, you know, are in contact with the students. Who do you envision coming in? How do you? hope this document and these collection of documents are going to serve the Stanford community? Yeah, most of the users are students in the first place, and mm -hmm. we have, the majority of them are graduate students, and they are doing research in the fields of Middle Eastern studies, Iranian studies, and we have some undergraduate students, and uh, for example, more recently we had some students working on the issue of hijab uh, and mm -hmm. under the Islamic Republic. And so they had to use this um, archival. Th these are actually rare materials. Uh, yeah. They are kept as, as our special collections. Asghar Agha and other uh, publications of those early years after the revolution. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that the end user of this type of um, you know, archival sources will be undergraduate students, graduate students uh, here at Stanford. And at the same time, they are available on site for visitors from other institutions uh, mm -hmm. around the US, around the world. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's. And another slightly academic question um, for Dr. Milani, if you'd like to, anybody would like to add in. Having these materials on the campus, in the archive, for anyone to access is amazing. And the generosity of the family to share these with the public is also very wonderful. If you got to devise a curriculum that incorporated this text, how do you think that would look? Well, first of all, I, I want to say that uh, because of the diversity of archival material we now have at Stanford, I can say with certainty there is no place in the world, and I'm not being bombastic, uh, Dr. Gereklu knows the archives around the world very carefully. There is nowhere in the world that has as much material on contemporary Iranian politics, culture, uh, uh, leftist movement than Stanford. So henceforth, if you want to do study of Iran, I don't care if you're undergraduate here, if you're a scholar, if you want to do a study of a women's movement in Iran, I don't think you can now write it without consulting Guri Mughatams, because we don't have anything like this. 
We don't have another woman of this stature, of this erudition, of this determination, who has written everything on a daily. We're just publishing, uh, the Gareth uh, and I just published the first volume uh, of Shad Man's memoirs. From 1926 to 1966, every day, this man who is an intellectual, who is a minister, who is, has written daily journals. So I think we, we are now the indispensable place mm -hmm. for this. And if I was to write, uh, do a curriculum on her, uh, I would say daily life for Iranian women in 20th century. Mm -hmm. It's just a remarkable collection of data. I want to remind you of the fact that I want to share this with you that this is a very important part of the world of Farsi. It's a very important part of the world. I'm confident that in the world of the world, without a doubt, you don't have to say that you don't have to say that, but there are many women who are young, که نسل بعد ما قصهشون رو مدل هرجو تکرار خواهد کرد و در این شک نکنید منتها شرایط زمان ایجاب نمیکنه و حجم فشار زمان هرجو در یک دوران آزادی و حق انتخاب بودن و زنان الان ما بسیاری در این زنانی هستند فوق العاده زحمت میکشند مبارزه میکنند و قصه هاشون بعد ها بیرون خواهد موارز And there will be a great deal more in future, uh, like Huri Mugadam. She lived in a time where there was relative freedom. Uh, others will do it in the future. But there's also now the social media. People, I know there are several places right now who are monitoring and uh, archiving every story on uh, social media about women. And those are like the daily journal. Mm -hmm. But then that of them are secrets. Uh, write even on media or talk about it what they're going through. So this will come later. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. sure. Is this book going to be published in uh, Persian also? In Farsi. In Farsi. Yeah. The book? If, if I answer. I think based on what we have here, my impression was that she was planning to publish a seven volume set of the diaries in Persian version. Mm -hmm. And she has already did, actually the text is done. And we have this division of uh, volumes and we know uh, which volume covers which years. And so that's my impression that she was planning to do this uh, originally in the first place. And, but then this translation project came up and they decided to publish it in English. But, um, That was the, the first uh, plan. I think our next step has to be to publish those seven exactly. volumes. Absolutely. Don't you think that Iranian would love to absolutely. I think read this book in absolutely. Iran? I mean, this is... Yeah, because most of the... Yes, most of the diaries are in French, mm -hmm. and right. so uh, only three uh, notebooks are in Persian. Mm -hmm. The first one uh, covering 1988, And the last two, 2013-2014. And these are the only Persian ones. The rest of them are in French. And these volumes are the summary translations into Persian by the author of those uh, volumes in French. Mm -hmm. um, we had a question. Um, I have a question for Leila. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so we heard about Mayam's relationship with mom and usually that's the way it is like moms and their kids are more strict than moms and uh, I mean grandparents and their grandchildren. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your relationship with Urijun. Oh she well mm -hmm. the, some things skip generations. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> so we have this picture. My daughter Lily is here, so she would be the fourth generation of the women here. <laughs> and um, there's a little picture of her sitting next to Mama Huri, where they were comparing the contents of their purses. <laughs> so these types of traits skipped my mom and my generation and went straight to Lily. So I can say that about Mama Huri. But, you know, I think the part that has been very influential for both of them, actually, for both my mom and, and Mama Huri, as we call her, is that they were fearless and they got their rights. Nobody treated them the way they should not be treated. And they spoke, they said what needed to be said, and nobody took advantage of them. They stood up for themselves, and as we heard, in times where that was exceedingly unpopular, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, that's something you sort of carry. I, I, think, I think that's in the DNA, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the things that are now normal, for my generation, maybe definitely for Lily's generation, you know, were not normal for somebody born in 1919 but they were her normal. And so when you grow up in an environment where it's normal that your grandma does these things, that she went to the Sorbonne at the age of 65 because she was bored, you know, and she could, that she lived on her own until she was 92, and she took, you know, a lot of the things that she did by nature has now been proven. You were talking about the languages and all that. You know, she would say, I speak English, you know, to my, my ladies who help me, and I speak Farsi to you guys, so I should write my diary in French so that I practice all the languages so I remember them all. It's just one example. I mean, the, the fact that language helps, you know, cognitive skills and maintaining them. So these are the kinds of things she just knew. You know, we would have a great time. I spent the most time with my grandmother in Nice, actually, because oftentimes she would be there and, and my husband and, and I and our children would be there, and we would go to dinner at her house, and we would take her shopping, and she was so particular about things, and we would enjoy the way that she had to choose everything and just be, you know, and what was interesting was it was really important to her that she looked after her guests. These are just these traits mm -hmm. that you just, when the moment happens, you remember, you know? And so she would write down what she wore and what she cooked for you if you were to come to her house so that she wouldn't repeat it next time. You know, if you just think about these things, I'll, I'll share something else. These are her pearls. And she used to say, you know, people buy pearls and they put them in a dark box where they die. They should be worn next to the skin so that they can be alive. You know, there's just these things, or the yellow and brown thing. You sort of in, are in this moment and you suddenly remember, and it's always been there. And my mother's the philosopher, I'm not. Um, and she taught philosophy you know, unlike the, the subjects we were talking about, one of the things she always said, which I think is pertinent here, is, and Daddy knows this because he is part of the School of Philosophy as well, is that when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, this book has appared mm. at this time. Very true. You know, this was something my mother said often, and. They all had these threads that kind of ran through them. They were you know, different people. But if you think about it, all these things we've talked about have these themes running through them. And that's an example of where my mother's philosophy actually was quite similar to my grandmother's way of life. But they didn't really see it that way as it happened. Mm -hmm. Your mom was remarkable. She was an eye teacher for four years. And then she I have to say something about the word remarkable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Through all of mom's cancer treatments, there would be these big write-ups about all the scans and all the things. And they would often say that it was unremarkable. Which was a good thing. And we would talk about yeah. how that was the only time it was OK to be unremarkable. <laughs> <laughs> Which meant there was nothing noticed, like it was no, no evidence of you know cancer found or whatever. And and Mama Hori used to talk about that. What do they mean that you're unremarkable? She's like, no, no, no. <laughs> this, is, this is a good thing in this case. So that's how I feel. I mean, the, a word. You said that word earlier, and it just took me back mm -hmm. to all of that. So we, we all have this in us. And, and when the moment happens, it comes back. Uh, the gentleman in the white, and then yes. Yes, that's you. Okay. 
Um, for being such an independent, strong woman, I was a little bit surprised that she was a devout Muslim and, 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 mm -hmm. and uh, really well studied in Islamic literature. Can you comment a little bit more about that? Does she, for example, believe in any kind of modern interpretation of Islam or things like that? Did she follow some sort of Islamic school of thought? Or was she just completely independent in that regard as well? She had her own interpretation of Islam. <laughs> and she thought that was the true, only genuine version of Islam. It was tolerant. Uh, it didn't uh, force its values on others. It didn't wear hijab, uh, but it also believed that there was a creation. Uh, I'm sure if she knew that we are having this conference with a Kurdish writer in a building called the Hamid and Christina Mogaddam Conference Center in a room called Christina Mogaddam, she said, God wanted it. <laughs> I would say, no, no. He said, no, you don't understand. <laughs> you young uh, leftists, you don't understand. You have lost your faith. I, she wasn't a Sufi, uh, if that's what you mean. She, uh, it, no, I, I never saw a no. strain of Sufism in her. But I also never saw any doubt that she considered herself unabashedly and unshamefully a Muslim. She didn't hide it. I mean, some Definitely. people, you know, there are some people in Marin County who have Sofre Hazrat Fatima, but they do it in hiding because they don't think it's fashionable to be yes. Muslim. She absolutely didn't care about fashion. And I say my prayer, said it to me, and you know, first time I, I, she invited me, said, I don't serve no alcohol. If you're expecting that, no alcohol here. So she put that to rest. <laughs> There's a wonderful scene in the book where a family member of hers gets married to a very conservative family, and the grandmother or the mother-in-law insists that the new bride covers completely in the house, and she comes crying to Huri, and Huri says, I pray five times a day. There are ways around this, <laughs> you know, and gave her the encouragement to pursue what she thought was a right. middle route, right. you know, um, which was very bold, I think, for a woman at that time. Actually, she took that after her father. Uh -huh. My grandfather was for many years, he was the ambassador to the, uh, to the uh, so Russian Virginia. Empire. So well, Virginia. in those days, Russian yeah. Empire, yes. And at all the official you know, events, they would be drinking wine. So Aga John, as we used to call him, would raise the glass take it to his lips, and return it back mm -hmm. in, pretending that he was drinking. But he was a devout Muslim too, and he would not. So there was this kind of play between the two worlds uh, where they kind of moved very effortlessly, and yet you know, very true to their beliefs. And as, as Dr. Milani said, not at all ashamed of it or bashful about it and, you know, tolerant of others. Mm -hmm. I remember one of the things that my mother used to say to me is, you haven't done your, I know you've given up on doing your namaz, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> to, to the last day, she would be doing her namaz seated because she could not bend all the way. And yet she was this very modern, having, you know, driven at the age of 16 in those days and uh, riding horses and That's skiing top-notch and, you know, speaking two languages. She was a very interesting, I would call her a Renaissance woman in the modern sense of the word. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, the woman in the jacket. Yeah, um, just wanted to say that my young woman was very similar mm -hmm. to her, yes. her mom. Um, do you see yourself as a your mother? Do I see myself as my mother? Um, I, mean, her faith, you see uh, I think the one thing that I do see very much from my mother in myself is the fact that I'm outspoken, that I have survived a corporate life all these years working for others and have not gotten into trouble, even though I always speak my mind. And it's very uncorporate to do that. So maybe 
from a progression standpoint, in terms of a career climbing standpoint, it hasn't been very good, but I'm comfortable in my skin. So that's the one thing that I think is definitely the threat that you know, runs at least in the family. Yes. You know, the incredible thing is that, you know, she never needed to work financially, yeah. but she always worked. Yeah. And the teacher's salary is meager. Yeah. She drove a fancy car to her work that made a splash. This is, uh, a body remembered it. But she insisted because she knew her economic independence, working, was part of what right. made her And I who think she was. another thing about my mom, which was amazing, and I think it's in all of us, it, what you're talking about, work ethic is one discipline. Mm -hmm. the, 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 I mean, she, I remember to the very last day, I used to help her into, the, into her bathroom to brush her teeth. I mean, this brushing of the teeth <laughs> was so careful and meticulous. And, you know, it was just that discipline of everything has its place, it has to be done a certain way. Um, I think that carries in most of us. Absolutely. I'm 74 and I'm still working. And, and people around where I work are, you know, amazed. At, why don't you retire? And I say, retire and sit on the beach and do what? You know? So I think that that is definitely one of their legacies on both sides, parents. Yes? In terms of um, representation for our culture, which is something I've been concerned about for some time, uh, for people who aren't familiar with Persian culture, um, is there any, um, has, there, has there been any thought of contemporaries and uh, finding other sources that will maintain the accuracy of your, your mother's life and legacy? Comparative, uh, you know, sort of context. You want to respond? No, I, I think that's the work of scholars. Mm -hmm. uh, we can't do it. We, uh, we're, we're too close to it. Uh, they, they certainly can't do it. Their relatives. Uh, it, it's going to take time. But I, I have no doubt, I really have no doubt, uh, that this collection will become an indispensable thing to do exactly what you said. What did women under the Pahlavi era live like? How do they think? What was their values? Mm -hmm. That's right. And she is a singular, not all of the women were like that. I mean, she had a very unique reality. She comes from an aristocratic Kurdish family, uh, marries into a, a wealthy bourgeois Tehrani family. She has essentially everything she wants. Uh, but she doesn't less rest on those. She wants to make it on her own. Out of that comes today. Your mom was exceptional, remarkable lady. And I always looked up to her. I grew up because I was in the family. And she loved the two of you and your family so dearly. In fact, the, the passage I read about the Revolutionary Court, she was saying with your parents yes. when she was doing that. Yes. And every time she came back to the house, she used she used to tell your parents what she, the conversation had been, and they would be, you know, surprised that she had managed to come back, that they had <laughs> locked her up because she was so outspoken. My but you know what? She had a way of delivering it that, um, while it was very f fearless, at the same time, I don't know why they didn't. <laughs> she didn't get into trouble. I have no idea. <laughs> they loved her. My mother truly loved yeah. her. Looking at her like her sister and yeah. your father was like her brother. And I grew up with her, with the family, your uh, Mrs. Safinia That's right. was a principal of my school and your mom was a teacher, my English teacher, and her class was lifeless. And every time I sit down with her through her last years, I'm enjoying her. Mm -hmm looking up to her. And I remember many, many, many years ago, she was telling my mother that Mohsen, her husband, is telling me, why are you working? Why are you teaching? 
the uh, salary that you are making, I'm giving more to my housekeeper. Mm -hmm. Why are you working? He doesn't understand that yeah. why I'm working. Yeah. And that she was remarkable. Thank you. Thank you. And one of the things that you inherited, and Hamid inherited from her, is the sense of uh, responsibility and principles. Yeah. She always kept her principles. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you very Amazing. Much. Mrs. Safinia, I remember every morning in the school she would come and talk to us. And one of the days that Indira Gandhi was a, um, was a main, prime minister of India, she said, girls, don't forget, you can be one of, one of these days, you can be prime minister of Iran. And, and your sisters, they've been amazing. Thank you. Congratulations yeah. to all of you. Thank you. Telling your mother like her. Thank you. And grandmother. Thank you. And to all of us Iranians for having and all of us. Yes. Well, one of her students is sitting right there, Monir Jun. <laughs> you were, how many years did you have my mother as a teacher? Was it in, it was in, in Nurbash, right? It was in high school, right? My, my husband, no, he, he wasn't a, a, a student. Even. No, no. You, I was. You were in was, high school. Yeah, yes, Did she I, teach you French? She, she taught, I think, two years English. Okay. Other than that, uh, and she wasn't very proud of that mm. <laughs> because her really love of language was for French. Mm. And, yes. Yeah. And then she was teaching uh, French at the time, but I was lucky to have her as a. As and, a and I looked up to her, and she took care of me. She really did. She was. The first thing I remember when I got a job with the government, she came by and passed, there was a meeting, and then she she bent and then told in my ears that she said, I'm so proud of you. Excellent. I heard that many, many times, and that lifted me up. Yeah. And any any place that there was something happening, she would take me there and introduce me. Yes. She took me with her to Paris. Yeah. There was a big meeting, and um, she invited me. I was her guest, and she introduced me to all the dignitaries. Yeah. She's my student. <laughs> yeah. She was promoting yes. other women, yeah. which is now so fashionable to talk about yeah. in corporate America, that the people who are becoming successful should not forget the others that they can lift. But she was practicing that all of her life. She also liked my husband very much. Yes, he did. <laughs> she did. <laughs> he was he was a Kurd. His Yemen yeah. from Kurdish family. Also he's is from um, his uh, mother's side is uh, related to Buriju. Oh I had no yes. idea. Yeah. And Mulkara is mm -hmm. his mother's last name. And uh, she knew, and she, she, one time when one of the Arbalans passed away, who was my brother-in-law, yeah. she was here in San Francisco. She came all the way from San Francisco to Mountain View. She had a, mm, uh, rented a car, came over, and stayed there for four hours. <laughs> and then when she was leaving, then she told me, you know, your sister-in-law should be an opera singer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really? <laughs> she got up and sang my yeah, sister-in-law, yeah, 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 yeah. which was true. She sang, you know. That's wonderful. <laughs> but she was an exceptional woman, like she said. And my life has been influenced by her. And I tell you something, that, that year that she was teaching us, we were, I think, like 25 students in Bezasha Cabbage School, that right. was also called right. Mubash. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the graduates of that class, they, they went to be very successful women. Yes. True. Doctors, writers, poets. Yeah. The interesting thing, you know, there's a lot of talk these days about work-life balance for women. And 
I think that our mother was really one of the, oh, she was the symbol of it. I mean, our birthdays, the details. I remember when Firuze had a birthday for one of her kids, and my mother went and we were, and this was when the boys were younger. She, we got back in the car and she goes, and they called this a birthday? <laughs> they just ordered the cake from the outside, and they've gone, what are you? And, we, and she was, I mean, it was a bit, I mean, she used, she held nothing back. She would definitely <laughs> speak her mind. And she was right. I mean, she would sit there for hours and hours and all these beautiful sandwiches, three, four tiered cakes, all baked at home, and you know, we had staff and everything. It was a different lifestyle, but she was she just, I mean, for her, honestly, the balance was always there. She was as driven outside as she was inside. So anyway, we were lucky people, I think. <laughs> I think we have time for maybe one last question. If sure. anyone has a burning question, we have an 8 o'clock curfew. Um, but this is your last chance with this panel, so you might as well take it. Because otherwise, it's just the book, which is very wonderful and rewarding. But these are the voices inside of them. And you will see them as babies. So that's exciting, too. Not me. No, nope. Dr. Milani is not in the book as a baby. <laughs> I mean, if no one has a question, I do have one. Okay. And it's for the two of you because yeah. of how closely you knew her. I'm meeting this woman who you've all known for so long, it feels. Um, the one who's known her the longest is my dad. Yes, so please, if you'd like to join in this question. Um, if she was here now to sort of mm, think about the coming generation, say from now until 50 years of women both in Iran and in the diaspora, what would be her advice, given her lived life, to these women? I think mom, regardless of the times, would say the same thing. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter now, then, or whenever. Be independent, do what you believe in, stand up for what you think, and speak your mind. I mean, that was just basically her motto. She she just never um, she never compromised in order to gain advantage, mm -hmm. and she always used to say to me, "I could have been one of those first women, uh, you know, members of parliament, secretaries, let's say ministers, etc." But I was too outspoken. And I think there's a passage in a book where yes. uh, when she, they finally name her deputy minister of education for two months so that she can become yeah. a senator or right. something. They have to have a prior history. And she turns around and she said um, that somebody said when they heard about that, they said they finally got the brains to put someone in that position that really deserves it. This was in a passage, in a part of the yeah. book that. Um, I can't remember when well, it was. Well, she also tells the interrogator that you were the deputy minister said, oh, yes, right. they appointed me that's and right. I resigned because months. they didn't let me do my work. Exactly. She was a deputy minister for two months. Yes, that's true. Yeah. But that is what I think she would say regardless of the times. You're good. I think it's a lasting yeah. message, actually. Yes. <laughs> Leila, do you have I think in today's language, it would be resilience, conviction, and purpose. Mm. Mm -hmm. And we used to talk about this in Nice a lot. We would be alone more in Nice than anywhere else. And there's a lot of palm trees in Nice. Mm -hmm. Lily, when she was little, would call them spider trees. Mm -hmm. And you know, there was a lot of wind, and they would you know, bend, but they wouldn't break. Mm -hmm. And we would talk about that, because it was the early days of the revolution, and you know, mm -hmm. a lot of uncertainty and all these things. And we would talk about that. So I think, and I think all of us have it, resilience, conviction, and purpose. And she, that was her brand. Mm -hmm. Today it would be called her brand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Did you want to add anything? I think Uri John lived in the present always, as far as I remember. And I think if she was still with us, she would be very proud of the progress of Iranian women, mm -hmm. especially. I mean, not only in their presentation against aggression and mm -hmm. oppression in Iran, but also about the success of the Iranian women abroad, where there's been an opportunity. When you think there was a, a, 
an Iranian lady who went to the space, mm -hmm. etc. Mm -hmm. I mean, you only have to look around and see the positions that the Iranian women have shown they can hold and be helpful and useful. She would be very proud of this because they were pioneers. Mm -hmm. I sincerely feel that they were really without any force or pressing their points, but they acted as an example of how women should be, mm -hmm. despite the, you know, not everything was available to mm -hmm. them because of time, you yeah. know, there was certain things. Yeah. So I think she would have been very proud of where women, and especially Iranian women, mm -hmm. are, whether it's in Iran or abroad, everywhere. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you so much. I do feel like this is the book itself and her life and inside of all of her family and friends here are the seeds of bigger movements to come. And so thank you very much, all of you tonight, for sharing and celebrating this book. Thank you.